Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 80. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the strategy, people process, and technology components of transformation. I'm here with my co-host, Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. We've got another great episode uh, for everyone here today. We're going to cover a few different topics, but before we get into that, uh, just a quick reminder that we have new episodes of this show that are released every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and all of the audio podcast platforms out there in the marketplace. So be sure to check us out. Uh, past episodes are out there. Be sure to subscribe, give us a review, and share it with your colleagues and peers, if you don't mind, just to help us get the word out. We love uh, love connecting with more people in the digital transformation community. A great episode for you today. As always, we have three major segments of the show. We're going to start off with some hot topics today where we'll get into things as diverse and as what I think will be entertaining. Uh, modern tech from the Jetsons. Um, mm-hmm. When we were first prepping for this, by the way, when, when you said modern tech from the Jetsons, I was thinking the Flintstones. And so I was, I was having a, <laughs> having a disconnect. Totally like, yeah. yeah, that's a polarity yeah. there. No, no. Um, hopefully we've achieved all of the digital transformations within the Flintstones. I think that's safe okay. to say. But Good. I was, I was a little, I was a little scared yeah. coming into this recording thinking that we were going to talk about Flintstones. So we're not, yeah. we're going to talk about modern technology uh, from the Jetsons. Uh, we're going to talk about a digital transformation case study with the Seattle Mariners, which is a professional uh, baseball mm-hmm. team in the United States. Um, they recently went through a digital transformation. So we're going to talk about the Seattle Mariners digital transformation home run and uh, hopefully some good lessons there. And then we'll talk about Elon Musk's absurdism. Mm-hmm. So I guess uh, a lot of people would say that Elon Musk is somewhat absurd, but mm-hmm. some would say in a good way. Some might argue otherwise, but we'll talk about Elon Musk's absurdism, which, uh, by the way, we're still trying to get him as a guest on the show. I haven't quite lined that up yet, but I'm hoping that any day now he's he, he's Clearly, he must listen to the show, I would Absolutely. imagine. 100%. If I give him enough, if I give him enough shout out, he'll eventually just call or tweet me. Oh, definitely. Say, definitely. He, he wants in on this. Yeah. Sure. Um, and then the last thing we'll cover in terms of hot topics, compliance being the main disruptor in the global supply chain industry. Mm-hmm. So that'll be uh, an interesting topic as well. Some, so some pretty interesting uh, current topics to talk about within digital transformation to start the show. And then later, uh, Kyler, you and I are going to host a Q&A related to organizational change management, mm-hmm. uh, sort of a free form. Uh, you've got some questions for me you're going to start with, and then we're going to take some audience questions as well um, to talk about some of the uh, different components of change management, some lessons and tips and that sort of thing. So stay tuned for that panel, discu- or that not a panel discussion, but the audience uh, Q&A mm-hmm. um, to talk about change management. And then last but not least, well, we're excited to play you a clip from a YouTube video that we released not too long ago. And it's a top 10 list of the top ERP systems for 2023. And this was actually a video that you can also find the content from in our 2023 digital transformation report. So this will just focus on the top 10 ERP systems, but that's a subset of what we cover in that digital transformation report. So that should be a good, um, a good segment as well. So be sure to stick around for that. But before we get to those, other topics. What uh, what are these hot topics you've got for us, Kyler? Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with the Jetsons. Um, so in honor of George Jetson's birthday, uh, there was a recent article on on five technologies from the Jetsons that have actually become become um, mainstream modern technologies. And this was sixty years ago uh, that the Jetsons actually started. And the Jetsons, for those of you that don't know, is a, a classic cartoon, very similar to the, the Flintstones. However, they are in um, a very technology-savvy space 
uh, ecosystem with their family and all of those types of, of different things. So a, a modern classic here. So one of the technologies I wanted to kind of hone in on as the other five or the other four, I should say, are, are pretty mainstream. We know all know voice tech, we know video calling, those types of things. But one that they had that I thought was interesting was food printing. So basically, if you've seen in the Jetsons, you choose what you eat, want to eat on a little um, console machine, and the food replicator actually automatically produces the very tasty looking food. Um, so in 2006, I'm not sure if you know, Eric, but the, uh, the Cornell, um, Cornell, excuse me, which is a very um, prestigious university here in the United States, uh, actually looked at creating a 3D printer capable of printing food. So basically what this does, it has a series of syringes that all fill with substances like chocolate or cookie dough or those types of things. And they use cartridges of powdered food components, such as proteins or simple carbohydrates. Um, and then they can print different types of food. So we all know kind of the, the Keurig method of, of getting our coffee now, which has kind of changed here, at least in North America and, and in Europe too. Um, they're very prominent. But do you think that we will be printing our food in the next 60 years, Eric, such as George Jetson did for his birthday cake? Well, if the Jetsons predict it, then I would think then we probably are, maybe. Yeah. Um, no, but uh, actually, when as you were talking about, it, I first of all I hadn't heard that that um, case study for or use case from two thousand six, but um, it made me think of three D printing. And I I could twenty years ago I wouldn't have thought three D printing was a real thing or realistic, but it is, and the organizations use it to make a lot of different prototypes and some pretty complex prototypes for that matter. So I can't imagine that food production, at least getting the taste right. Mm -hmm. would be that far behind. I guess the question would be if you're talking about, you know, meat, are you, are you talking about real meat or is it mm -hmm. the taste of meat injected with some protein powder or whatever? Um, the other thing it reminded me of too, by the way, just as a quick side note that ties back to the name of this podcast, um, Transformation Ground Control is a reference to David Bowie. David mm -hmm. Bowie has a song called Space Oddity. It's about a guy named Major Tom that goes into space. And there's a reference to taking protein pills in space and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So it's, it's sort of a futuristic view of how to survive in space because that song was from the you know late 60s. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of so you've got the Jetsons, you got David Bowie that are all pointing mm -hmm. towards this idea that you could have food production or alternative food production like that. So I don't I don't see why not. I mean, technology changes so fast. I, I can't imagine that it's that far off. Absolutely. Well, I hit all you know the the transformation ground control marks data points right at front. So it's all That's down. Totally, was that totally intentional? You knew yeah. that you were going to, yeah. any, any excuse for me yeah. to bring up David Bowie and the name Absolutely. ground control? hundred percent. That's branding. That's what I, you know, what's what I do, but <laughs> right. <laughs> speaking of branding. Um, so the, the Seattle Mariners um, here just went through a large digital transformation within their organization and their customer experience. So I kind of wanted to, you know, talk through what they did. And I thought um, I'd share an interesting quote from their SVP of technology about digital transformation that I feel like really sums up when you have a customer facing um entertainment specifically industry which obviously the major league baseball is and these large experiences such as um a stadium but she said in addition to serving our fans we've upgraded hr finance business intelligence and sales and marketing applications to do so we commit to being a leading organization that embraces a growth mindset innovative change and continuous improvement as part of our job that requires strong change management skills in addition to tech investment savvy so i wonder do you know her or no because that sounds like an, an eric kimberling quote um and before you answer, yeah right let me tell you a few things that they've upgraded so they have taken their wi-fi from um they've upgraded to six and five g capabilities, which I didn't even know six was a thing yet, but here we are um, for their infrastructure so they could utilize the data that their customers are utilizing through their mobile devices to be able to give them a more enhanced and personalized experience. Uh, they also have their T-Mobile Park, which is what the stadium is called, 
walkout technology, which is very similar to Amazon's walkout technology, that now fans can go in stores and just simply walk out with either food or beverage op options. And then they also have self-serving um, food and beverage stations that customers can go through that take weight lines, lines down. I don't know if you've ever been to a you know, a, a major league baseball game where you're waiting in line for a hot dog or a beverage, you know, for a certain amount of time, but that's never a good thing to miss all of the action that's going on on, on the field. So they tried to streamline that, that traffic flow. So those are just a few things that they did on the customer facing side that you've actually noticed as a spectator in the, the stands. But I think it's interesting that they felt as though they needed to change their, all their internal technology structure too. So I thought I'd get your feedback on that. Well, I like how they, they have, it sounds like they had a clear vision of what they wanted to accomplish mm -hmm. with their digital transformation, which I think is an important first step that not enough organizations articulate well. You know, a lot of times they, they're sort of forced into a digital transformation by necessity, and therefore they just go upgrade their technology for technology's sake. Whereas it sounds like these guys at this organization were really focused on you know, improve, improving that customer experience, being more innovative, flexible, all the stuff you talked about. I guess the the one caveat or the one uh, word of warning or caution with that is that's all great. That sets, you the, that sets the high level parameters, but you really need to unpack that in a bit more and define how exactly we're going to achieve those things and how exactly mm -hmm. will our digital strategy and roadmap help us accomplish those things and what's the business case behind that. Um, I don't know whether or not they did those things or not, but I would just sort of add that as a, as a next step that you would need mm -hmm. to do in addition to articulating that high level of vision is to define what the business benefits are, business value, and what the measures are behind that. Yes, it's very, it's, it's a very good point. Um, and the, the overall process and case study laid out a lot of information too on, on how they've created this change, not only culturally, but also innovating um, America's game, right? Baseball is a very um, traditional industry to be in, um, especially here in the United States. And then we also have um, the major league baseball teams are in Canada as well. Um, so it's, it's something that it's interesting to see kind of that evolution of being able to sit in the stands and what that experience looks like. So definitely a really cool case study. Yeah, absolutely. That's very cool. So let's move on to Elon Musk and his absurd nature. Um, so basically this, this article takes a, a classic psychology study um, and talks about how Elon Musk as an individual is really able to kind of create this, um, this absurdism uh, and make innovation kind of birth change um, in a way that usually people wouldn't have the ability to get on board with specifically um, business cultures. So I'll take you through kind of the psychology experience because it's kind of interesting. So the experiment um, takes a handful of people and asks them to identify different lengths um, of a line. So are they long or short? What does that look like? So most respondents in this situation, they give their answer, um, and say, you know, this line is short, this line is long. Uh, however, what happens is in this study, they actually have um, people that work for the scientists that are saying this line is actually longer, it's not shorter, when in reality, that's not the case. Um, so basically, what happens is a lot of times from a psychology standpoint, there's this demonstration of conformity to say if you have a pressure situation where a bunch of other people are saying, no, this line is shorter, no, this line is shorter, and um, you change your choice to match the majority, even though you know logically that that's not correct or that's not rational. So basically, um, the, the study, the reason that it showcases Elon Musk's power is that he creates this narrative or this fantastical realm through his branding. So he says things like um, aliens built the pyramids, AI could give us immortal dictators, cyborg dragons might have a place, you know, within, <laughs> within um, our overall future. And he doesn't talk about things that are pragmatic to his industry a lot of times, 
like charging station, defective batteries, the atmosphere on Mars that he's trying to take everyone to live on. Um, they, they're just unnecessary because of, of the way he creates this additional realm of reality that outweigh longstanding habits and knowledge that would otherwise raise doubts and stifle innovation. So a very interesting way to look at how he actually um, weaves this theory of absurdism into his overall business practices and can a lot of times transcend typical barriers that other companies have had trouble doing. So he does this to drive change? Like he's getting people to see things differently? Is that sort of why he's doing this? I think he... I don't know that um, he knows he's doing this, but I think that the author here is arguing that what he does is uses his own storytelling abilities to create innovation through taking away the normal narrative around this is a roadblock, this is a challenge, this is a, those mm -hmm. types of things. Um, and he, you know, obviously disrupted the automotive industry with the electric car or, or Tesla and being one of the first businesses that can manufacture chips domestically, which we know has been a huge disruption within the supply chain for other manufacturers. Um, and he creates that shift without all of the typical red tape that goes around other industries trying to do that. So I think that the interesting part here is, is there a way in your opinion, to kind of create a alternative reality, if you will, that focuses on only digital transformation success. And that's all you talk about in that narrative, as opposed to focusing on failures. Looking at Elon Musk's um, overall model here, it would kind of be interesting to just only focus on what you could do with technology as opposed to things that you can't. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, it, as you were talking, I couldn't help uh, but think about what's happening in society today um, with with governments and certain, you know, the polarization of opinions and politics and how the government at times will create an alternate definition. Like, like for example, in the United States, our president recently declared that we are not, in fact, in a recession, even though all the indicators point to the fact that Historically, this is, I think we're pretty well in alignment that we are in a recession, mm -hmm. but president of the United States comes out and says, we are not in a recession. And, you know, it's sort of like creating an alternate reality and whatever side you're on, you could argue there's an alternate reality. Um, but I, so I, that's, that's why it's so interesting. I thought that's where you're mm -hmm. going with it. Um, but so it's interesting to hear about Elon Musk using that as a, as a gambit or a mechanism to drive change. I suppose where, where my mind goes with that, just sort of my knee jerk reaction is that it's it's almost like you have to, it's, it's almost a leadership type of thing. Like you have to have a clear vision that cuts through the status quo and you have to be confident in that direction and you have to articulate it repeatedly so that people understand the direction and understand the change or the innovation or whatever it is you're trying to drive within your organization. Not so much to create an alternate reality, but to create, to chart the path or the course that you're going to go down to get to that, call it the alternate reality, if you will. But that's where we're headed. We're moving to that alternate reality compared to where we are today. Um, but you're not. But you're doing that in a way that's not necessarily. I hate to use the word lying, but you're not lying or saying that this line is actually mm -hmm. shorter when in fact it is longer, or vice versa. You're actually just saying this is the way we do things today. This is how we're going to do things in the future. You're not saying this is how we're doing things today because it's not true. You're not doing those things today. You're, mm -hmm. you're defining how it's going to be tomorrow or at whatever point in the future. So I think it can be an effective way to, to drive that change. But I, to me, it's more about the, the conviction, the clarity, the conviction, the communication of that vision, all those things. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, that honesty based piece is really important. There's a difference between, like you said, you know, looking at something with a futuristic vision and saying like this exists today. And the thing I thought when I, I read this was actually about Elizabeth Holmes and, and Theranos um, talking about, you know, that huge, obviously failure when it came to a startup tech company 
and yeah, cool. um, that type of thing. So to me, that's kind of, you know, the, the gray area where you need to be able to say this is a futuristic vision, this could be possible, but still being able to keep your feet on the ground in reality, especially when it comes to raising capital. Yeah, and being realistic about where you are, you know, where you are today, you know, mm -hmm. so you can have that future state vision of, and uh, Theranos is a great example with, with uh, what's your name, Elizabeth? What's your last name? Holmes. Oh, Elizabeth Holmes. Um, that company, for those who don't know, is a biotech company that had this vision of a great product that never materialized. And she had a clear vision of what she wanted that company to be. Mm -hmm. They never quite got there. But the problem was she sold that vision as reality to her investors and then a bunch of investors lost a bunch of money. And then she goes to, goes on trial for, I don't even know what she was convicted of a lot of stuff. It's fraud. Yeah. Fraud. Which yeah. Is that, <laughs> which is kind of a big deal uh, in yeah. any, any culture, any country. Um, but I think that's, you know, to, so you have to be, it's, it's interesting. It's, it is an interesting balancing act because you have to be can, uh, clear and convicted in your future state and where your vision for where you want to head, but you also have to be realistic about where you are today. And it's going to, you know, as leaders, you're probably going to get frustrated by the fact it's going to take longer than you think to get to that future state vision. But you you kind of want to keep one foot grounded in today, but not mm -hmm. lose sight of that, that long term future. And it is a difficult balancing act for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, just an, an interesting way to look at the the psychology of Elon Musk. Right. And, and of course, to drop his name so we can continue to, you know, promote his uh, his overall engagement in transformation ground control, which I, you know, I feel like is a very big reality at one point. So I'm sure he has AI or machine learning or something that's scanning all yeah. of our content and all the content out there. And every time his name comes up, it flags it for him. So who knows, maybe the more time we say his name, he'll, uh, he will get his attention eventually. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, our last hot topic today is, is another um, very interesting way of, of looking at the global supply chain disruption and specifically compliance and the overall definition of compliance. And this study looked at three different types of compliance, which I feel like are very interesting. So regulatory compliance, obviously those are standards set by government agencies and entities when it comes to the supply chain. Supply chain compliance itself, which is the internal aspects of the supply chain that are affected during the buying, planning, and moving of goods process, such as labeling requirements, packing instructions, those types of different things that they have to be compliant to actually get within the shipping system, right? And then the last one, which I think is a really interesting one, is the social compliance. So the people, communities, and environment affected by the actions of the overall shipping company. And to give you some data around this, in, in a survey in, in 2019, it found that 81% of, con, of global consumers expected com companies to be environmentally aware um, and will happily switch to alternative brands if they feel like they're more sustainable. So the reason I think that this is so, this study is so um you know, relevant right now, specifically in, in the European markets is because of, you know, the, the global gas crisis due to the issues in the war, the war in Ukraine um, and how many of specifically German gas companies are kind of blowing the whistle to say, you know, you're going to need to learn how to live without these fossil fuels because we can't provide them to you at a price that's not going to be um, hugely inflated and um, influence overall economic life. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get your your feedback on that, Eric, to, to kind of see what you thought about that kind of social compliance piece and companies now really having to not only do obviously regulatory law-based, legislative-based compliance, but also from a branding perspective and a company value perspective. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, I, part of me thinks, well, it doesn't matter what I think because that's just the way it is. <laughs> you know, there, there is, there is regulation around, around that stuff. Um, I think organizations though, in general, especially bigger multinational organizations were already sort of headed that way. Um, I guess you could argue whether it's, it's because of compliance or, or perceived, future compliance or regulatory mm -hmm. issues. So organizations have started to move that direction. It seems like they're 
more organizations just this is just my qualitative perception i i have no science or data to back this but it feels like uh organizations were already valuing that stuff anyway and we're already heading in that direction not not all organizations but you know a fair number of uh you know multinationals so i think when you combine the social uh interests that organizations have you combine that with the regulatory side that's clearly i mean that i, I don't think there's a whole lot of ground to dispute that we're going to do anything but continue going that direction. Absolutely. And I, I actually have a, a personal case study that I'm interested in in you um, thinking about the supply chain disruption in this way, because in my opinion, there's so much compliance that now customer service takes a huge hit, specifically yeah. within the shipping industry. So my family recently relocated in Colorado. So we had moving trucks from a moving company. The moving company calls uh, three days before he moves, says, I can't get you the trucks that you need to move. You can either go get the trucks um, hours away or you can use different trucks. So, and that there's just nothing that they can do about that from the supply chain side and just the overall gas prices side. So we get two smaller trucks and then we have a trailer too that we pull one of our vehicles with. So the trailer is then broken. So we can't take that vehicle with us. They have no more trailers due to inventory issues. So a lot of times what we've found specifically in shipping, whether it's getting goods to your home, getting raw materials to actually produce products or you know being able to just move in general, like my case study is, it seems as though the customer is really the person or the, the stakeholder that's most effective by the, the global supply chain. But here we see in this study that they would still rather have that social compliance than that ease of use or that customer service based approach. What's your feedback to that? Yeah, I think it's, they're definitely in conflict, you know, the whole compliance yeah. and any sort of, uh, and not just the, global warming and, and climate footprint type stuff that mm -hmm. you hear about every day, but just, uh, just general regulations and international regulations too, by the way, it's not just one country or one mm -hmm. government. It's, it's multiple governments throughout the world that are trying to coordinate a global supply chain. And you've got to deal with all those different regulations. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, if an organization had more control over, you know, how much they, they did or didn't want to comply with regulations, which it's really not a choice if you want to be staying in business long-term, but if it were, then you, you would have sort of a dial or a balancing act you've got to follow here, which is, do we want to focus more on customer service or more on regulations and safety and, you know, minimizing carbon footprints, all that stuff. And oftentimes you can't have both. And so you've got to figure out where, where you want to be on that continuum. Um, problem is I just don't know that organizations have a lot of say mm -hmm. or choice in that. Although I will say that organizations do tend to do things on their own where they shoot themselves in the foot and create mm -hmm. a, a negative customer experience, not because of regulatory issues, but just because of their own internal bureaucracy and decision-making slowness and all that stuff. So I, you know, if I'm an organization, I might say, okay, well, I can't control the regulatory stuff. I've got to do that um, within reason. Uh, but what I can control is the stuff I'm doing on my own, which for a lot of, especially big organizations, they have so many complexities and red tape, bureaucracy, poor decision-making, lack of collaboration, all kinds of stuff that slow them down way more than any sort of regulation might. So I think that's what maybe a way to pivot off that and say, you know, yeah, regulatory regulations are what they are. You're not going to change that anytime soon. So focus on the things you can do to improve your customer experience or efficiency or whatever the goals are you're trying to accomplish. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because that regulatory compliance is a hard limit, right? But mm -hmm. the social compliance and the supply chain compliance could have things that are within their circle of influence, whether it is um, specific vendors that you work with or distribution routes that you go or fuel that you use. So it's a, it's a balancing act that kind of um, adds to the additional pressure of shipping companies or companies that need to get their products to, you know, their consumers in any way that they can. So yeah. definitely a, a very interesting change, which, you know, I think is a good segue into our Q and a panel about change and the great audience questions we had about 
overall change management, because that is one thing that even as hard as your industry or as many compliance or regulations that you need to go through, that should be included in your change plan so that you're able to understand the overall impact on the organization, um, especially with the, the current climate within our global supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that is a good segue. We, we uh, look forward to that conversation about change management and just really unpacking the whole concept of what it is, why it's important, how to get started, what are the major work streams you should be aware of, all that good stuff. Uh, we're going to cover that um, and take some audience questions too. We're going to take quite a few audience questions when we come back. But first, we'll take a quick break. We're, you're listening to Transformation Ground Control, and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. And we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event. It's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields. You get immediate access to all the recordings. And the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out, and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 80. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham, and you can find new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and all the audio podcast platforms, so be sure to check us out there. I'm excited for our next conversation, which Kyler and I are going to lead, but we are going to involve uh, questions from the audience. So we're going to talk about organizational change management, what it is, how to get started, why it's important, how to measure it, a lot of different stuff that we're going to start off with some topics that we have pre- defined, but we're going to switch pretty quickly to audience questions as well. So with that, let's jump into uh, some of the questions that you've got related to this, Kyler, and then we'll we'll get to audience questions after that. So Eric, I want to kind of jump in as you started your career in organizational change management um, and have really held it as one of the, the keys to transformation success. So can you give us a definition of organizational change management to kind of set the foundation of this conversation? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a great question because so many people use the term pretty loosely. It's, it's a pretty vague term that doesn't really tell you a lot about what, what it really means, um, which is part of what drives me crazy about modern change management. But uh, nevertheless, organizational change management, I think probably the simplest way to um, to categorize it or to define it is that it's anything, any activity or any effort that helps people transition through the change that they're going through. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, technology focused people will think that that must mean training and communications, just training on how to use the new system, communicating things about the new system. And that is certainly part of it, but that's just a small subset of the overall change management dimension, if you will. So it's it's everything from um, the early stages of, of getting people involved in a project. It's how people's jobs are going to change and helping define how the jobs are going to change, helping people understand and be a part of the process changes, helping them understand the new technology, um, you know, helping them understand what their new uh, accountability uh, metrics and, and overall responsibilities, what that might look like. So there's a lot to it. But it basically, if I were just to summarize it in one sentence, it's any activity that helps migrate the human or the people side of an organization to the future state. Absolutely. And did you see that little question on the side that said most change managers can't describe what they do without using the word change? Is that why you didn't use the word change in there? 
did I avoid using it? I did actually you didn't. Did. Say, uh, yeah. Normally, I, I, normally I do say the word change. Yeah. So I'm glad I just coincidentally did not say change, particularly for our <laughs> audience member here. And actually, yeah. while we're while we're doing that, before not to interrupt you, but why don't yeah. we? Uh, I thought maybe we could show some of the. Uh, um, if I can do it, it's not letting me do it. You don't see my. You don't see the chat no. on the on you the screen, do you? For some reason, it's just saying um, new comments there. If you select the 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 chat tab. But um, otherwise, we can kind of just talk through where we have some international audience joining us from today because there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot joining here today. We've got um, uh, Gilbert from Malta, Australia, Vinod from India. We have someone from Heilbronn, Germany, uh, Leeds, UK, Houston, Texas, Egypt, uh, KSA, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, Germany, Mexico, UK. Mm -hmm. um, just, just to name a few, another from Saudi Arabia, from, uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So a lot of, a lot of global audience, uh, here today from all over the world. So thank you for, for being here. Um, and the uh, comment that you had, I just had it right here. It's, it is a pretty interesting and funny comment. Uh, most change manager, change, most change managers can't describe what they do without using the word change. So, um, that's actually a good, uh, I've never really thought of that before. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, if you, you should be able to describe change management, I suppose, without using the word change and just describing, you know, what it is you're doing. Um, and I think that helps, it helps clarify the point for sure. Absolutely. And, and I think that uh, change is such an intangible thing and it can, um, you know, really surface a lot of, of emotional reactions around it to fear, which we see a lot of resistance come from. Um, so when we when we talk about a change management um, initiative when it comes to a digital transformation, can you kind of talk about the attachment between the two, um, digital transformation, technology implementation, upgrade, anything with a new technology, and the relationship to organizational change management? Yeah, it's a great question. Sort of a great foundational um context setting for for change management and and anytime you deploy any sort of technology even if it's a relatively simple upgrade which it never is simple but let's just say you're just doing an upgrade from vendor a to the latest version of vendor a's software um, even that you know using the same solution but an upgraded version usually that has a lot more significant impacts to the organization than people think um, and it's not again it's not just how to use the system it's not just new transactions or keystrokes or functions or capabilities within the system that people have to get used to, to get used to. Um, usually it's that people's jobs materially change, their responsibilities mm -hmm. materially change as a result of the technology, or at least they should materially change if you want to get the value out of the technology. Now, if all you're really trying to do is just put in new technology, you really don't care about efficiency, you don't care about improving performance or increasing business value. Um, if it's more of a necessity, if you will, then I suppose change management isn't as uh, material, but I would argue that that's not a recipe for success if, if you do go down that path. So any sort of technology initiative um, is going to have a material impact to an organization, in my opinion. And, um, you know, organizations need to, you know, have that clear vision of, of what that change is going to be and how they're going to help people get there. Absolutely. And I, I think we'll kind of dive into the, the measurement after we get through kind of some of our definitions. But Within digital transformation, when should change management be included? Well, you know, I always say that I've never met a client who has said that they started their change management too early and they regret doing that. Or if they could go back, they would have started their change management a little bit later. or They would have held off on the change management stuff. I've yet to meet a client um, that has said that. I also have yet, by the way, to meet a client that says that they wish they would have invested less time and focus on change management right. and that they spent too little time on change management. In, in contrary, it's usually the opposite. Even in cases where they hire third stage to help with the change management, um, even in those cases, it's still usually never enough. I mean, I guess when you, when you think of it, you can never start early enough and you can never really do enough change management. Um, and again, the reason is because it is such a big impact and it's so distracting oftentimes to, to focus on the technology stuff. Um, the technology stuff usually is a big distraction. It's a big time and resource suck. So what ends up happening is you end up neglecting the organizational and human side of it. So my, my view of change management is that you should absolutely do it as soon as possible. And in a perfect world, in an ideal state, you would do it even before you've really nailed down and um, gotten sign off on your implementation plan. 
-hmm. reason being that you can't realistically know how fast or how quickly you can deploy new technology effectively without fully understanding what your change strategy is. And even prior to that, understanding what the impacts of the organization are and how material or how big of a change it's going to be and who's going to be affected the most. Only by doing that sort of upfront assessment can you then define a change strategy and change management plan that really takes into consideration the things that are unique to you as an organization. And only by having that view of the impact of the organization and what your change strategy and plan is, only then can you have a realistic view of what the overall plan is going to be. Because mm -hmm. usually change management is something that that's going to take you longer than deploying technology. It's a lot easier and faster to deploy technology than it is to deploy technology that gets used by your business, gets embedded within your organization. So those are two very different things. And so you have to really have that clarity up front or else you're, you're flying blind going into your implementation. And too many organizations sort of draw a line in the sand that says, mm -hmm. okay, vendor says it's going to take 18 months to deploy technology, which is probably realistic. Vendor probably can deploy te technology in 18 months. But the problem is, can your organization ad adapt to and digest those changes and adjust to that new future state in 18 months? And most organizations, in that example, uh, the answer is no. So that so to answer your question, start as soon as you can, because the, the sooner you do that upfront organizational assessment, the sooner you have a clear change strategy and plan, the more effective you're going to be in the overall implementation. Yeah. And, and the more risk I think you mitigate when you have the awareness of the power of change management. And I think that's the, the piece that many people don't understand is it really has the power to either create a failure when it comes to an implementation or a huge disruption within business operations because of things like misperception, resistance you know, the v virality of communication within an organization that might not be correct. So understanding, uh, you know, what that impact could have, I think is so important. So let, let's talk a little bit about that software selection phase. Is change management important when you are selecting a software? It is. Um not only as part of your decision, but as I mentioned a moment ago, it's also part of your planning process or it should be part of your mm -hmm. planning process. So since I already mentioned the planning process, let's come back to the software decision part of mm -hmm. your question. And that is that, you know, when you're when you're choosing software and you're evaluating software, it's really important to do two, a couple things. One is to involve people in the process. So by involving people in the, the software selection, you're, you're sort of maybe unintentionally addressing the change, some of the change management issues that organizations face, which is people feel like they don't have control of the changes. And when people mm -hmm. feel like they have control, you know, one way to help people feel like they have control is to involve them in the changes and certainly, you know, helping make a decision around software and the appropriate technology for your organization is, is one way to do that. Um, the other thing too, is though, when you get into the decision itself, a lot of organizations focus so much on features and functions, you know, sort of their checklist of things they think they want technology to do, but they don't think about the cultural impact that that particular technology might have. And so I'll give you an example. Um, if you're a, if you're a really, you know, say you're a large organization, you're a multinational global organization, and you're trying to sort of standardize and scale your operations, and you're trying to take disparate processes and disparate systems, and you're trying to create sort of a common platform, a common target operating model, common way of doing businesses, doing business across the world. But then you go deploy a product like say Microsoft Dynamics. And I'm just picking on a couple of vendors that I could have put, put in a number of different vendors mm -hmm. in these examples. So don't put too much stock in this, but let's just say you, you go to deploy Microsoft Dynamics in that situation. Mm -hmm. Well, Microsoft Dynamics, uh, the cultural impact of that is Microsoft Dynamics is a super flexible product that's sort of meant to be tailored and it is meant to adjust to different situations. And that may not align with that culture you're trying to create or that future state that you're trying to create. Whereas something like an SAP that's more standardized, it's more rigid, it's meant to drive more common business processes than, than other systems, SAP might be a better fit in that case. And so that's that might better align with the culture fit that you're going for. Mm -hmm. Or on the flip side, if you're a very entrepreneurial organization, you're very nimble, you're constantly changing, you're constantly improving, then SAP might be too, too standard for you. It might be too rigid. Whereas mm -hmm. a Microsoft Dynamics might be more flexible. And again, there's a million different technologies out there. I just happen to pick those two because they're well known. But 
you can that that's the way that organizations oftentimes have to look at some of those intangible qualitative factors when when um, selecting software from a from a change management perspective. Absolutely. And I want to get to change management and company culture, but let's pull up some of these really great questions we're getting from the audience first. Um, sure. So, yeah, so I um, so we have one here. Is there any official certification industry recognized that one can do for change management? I think this is a really good question specifically for you since you have spent your career in kind of this space. So what would you say to um, those types of certifications? Yeah, so um, one of the more common um, and effective certifications that has evolved in the last decade or so has been uh, ProSci. So mm -hmm. getting ProSci certified is is one way to sort of build up your your toolkit or your your knowledge base of change management. Um, there's also other uh, change programs or change schools of thought out there like Cotter, um, K O T E R. Mm -hmm. He's he's a I think he's a professor and he created sort of a change management framework that's still referred to uh, today. It's, it's, it's something he developed a couple of decades ago. Um, but there's a couple of different frameworks and training courses you can do like that. ProSci has really become sort of the standard. Mm -hmm. um, but I always encourage people to think not just about change management right. directly and not just think of change management as a siloed, standalone mm -hmm. function that you need to get certified in or get training in, but also think about the other things that are going to help you navigate change. And that could be things like um, you know, Lean Six Sigma, for example, if, if you know Lean Six Sigma, some of the best change management consultants I know aren't just good at, you know, having ProSci certification and knowing sort of the change management stuff, but they also understand the operational stuff. They understand mm -hmm. the technical sides of things. So if you can sort of augment your change specific training with operational and or technology focus, that's a pretty, that's a really powerful combination and a highly effective combination, in my opinion. Gotcha. And, and when it, it comes to that, I think that's a, a really important piece of, of understanding both sides of it, because often some of our most effective change management practitioners are also operational specialists, too. Um, one thing that I would recommend is we recently have our um, 2023 report for digital transformation that's on our website. It has a whole organizational change section. So maybe start by reading that. Um, that's always helpful to be able to kind of get that information. Yeah, yeah, great point. And that is a, a great resource if you just want a primer that you could start right now as we're talking, you can go to our website and download that guide to change management. Um, yeah. Also, there, there's the comment too that is worth clarifying um, that I just showed a moment ago, but from uh, Hatem on LinkedIn, he says, Cotter does not pro provide certifications. That's a, it's an important clarification that Cotter does not provide certifications. You can read his stuff, you can follow his frameworks, follow his approach, but I don't know of any training courses that focus on Cotter. A lot of people just refer to that framework. Um, but as far as certification, ProSci does provide sort of, you know, sort of a course and a certification behind it. Mm -hmm. And great webinars. I always join their weekly rev webinars. They're just a great resource in general when it comes to this types of, of information. So let's get to these questions from um, Chris and Eva um, on, on LinkedIn, they kind of have the same sort of um, question of how do you have a conversation with execs who have factored in only a technical budget for transformation? How much of that budget percentage does change management add? And then Eva kind of generalizes, how do you convince upper management about the need to start the change management process early? So talking about this executive conversation and budgets and then prioritization around change management. How do you have that conversation with an executive group? Well, I, I think the, the I'll answer the second part of the question first and which will lead to the answer to the first one, but it, by convincing the, the way to convince the executive team is oftentimes to think about their language. What language are they speaking? And what, what language is gonna be most effective with them and different organizations have different answers and you have different leadership styles and whatnot. But, um, you know, most organizations it, it, that we work with at the executive level, they're not super excited necessarily about this sort of, a, a you know, a perceived and nice to have mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. like change management. Um, they also aren't super excited about something that's perceived as really fluffy or, you know, kumbaya focused. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all sitting around holding hands and feeling good about each other. That, that, that generally tends not to resonate very well with with uh, executives if they have that perception. 
So really, you know, the way I always try to view it is to, to speak their language. You're trying, why are you doing this project? First of all, why are you investing in technology? If you start by asking that question, oftentimes you get, you know, you start to scratch the surface. You start to get answers mm -hmm. like, well, you know, our old systems are outdated. We can't grow the company or our vendor is sunsetting the product. We've got to put in some new technology or um, we've got one programmer that knows how to, that knows our system and we can't be dependent on one person anymore. So we need a sort of an off the shelf system to help us get to the future. So you start there and then it, you know, that's sort of the superficial answer typically. And then you start to dig underneath that and say, well, what do you want this organization to look like after you go through this technology mm -hmm. deployment? And you sort of force the executives to think of this, not just as a technology upgrade, but more, what is it we're trying to accomplish as a business? And then once you get to that point, you're starting to dig down below the surface. Then you start to say, well, let's talk about what that impact to the organization is going to be. And you sort of have to start to unpack and paint a picture of what the impact of the organization is going to be. And that when, when you focus on the business value and the measurable results that executives expect to see mm -hmm. out of a transformation, whether it's, you know, net business benefits or whether it's just sort of what they want their business model to be in that future state or both. Um, then you then you start to connect the dots for them and say change management is the key to help us get there. It's not the technology. The technology alone will not help us get there. It gives us a base to work from, but the change management is what connects the dots between the technology that we deploy and the business results and that future state vision that the executives have. Um, and usually once you do that, then you know it's it's not easy, but you, you sort of have to translate this all for executives so they see and connect the dots with why change management is so important and how it fits into a digital transformation. Um, now I already for, forgot the, uh, the second part of the question, something about, uh, the, oh, the, the budget. Yeah. The budget piece of that. And I think that's the, the challenge. And I, I do think that's evolving because we do have clients that are, you know, million dollar plus change management clients that come to us for that service. So that is something that I think executives are, are more aware of, especially with COVID and understanding the importance of changing through a forced transformation or a hijack transformation. Um, but it is important to understand that change management does need a budget. It does need hard data and it does need KPIs. So can you kind of teach us a little bit about how you have that um, conversation with executives and allocating money and resources for these types of initiatives? Yeah, I, I guess just to start at the the high level, sort of a ballpark, back of the envelope sort of number, um, and I think ProSci might have sort of uh, might have um, published this data point, but I remember seeing somewhere from some change resource that's credible, and I know that's super vague and not credible of me to say it's it's don't don't worry about it. Someone that's super credible, I think it's ProSci, but it may be someone else. Um, but there was a study that shows that you know the quarter the sort of the right level or the um the appropriate level of spending for change mm -hmm. management is about 15 percent of the total budget so for every million dollars you're spending on a implementation you, you start thinking about one hundred fifty thousand dollars of uh, change management support and that's just a sort of a hard and fast really high level number that is going to vary from organization to organization but you can kind of use that as a as a starting point and then you back into you know first of all how big is the change because for some organizations, they're making such a massive change mm -hmm. and it's going to be such a huge impact to the organization that that number might actually be a lot higher for other organizations that are, say, younger organizations. Um, they haven't been around as long. They don't have the baggage and the, the history uh, that's harder to change and harder to evolve into what you're trying to be. Maybe it's a little bit less, but it's still going to be probably more material than mm -hmm. most organizations realize in both cases. Um, so I think if you start with sort of that 15 percent number and then and then back up and look at, well, let's look at us and benchmark us mm -hmm. to other organizations and how how much of a change are we making? Are we upgrading from a ERP system we deployed 10 years ago? We're just upgrading to a newer version. That's a pretty material change, but that's not as material as the organization that's using a green screen, a custom developed mainframe solution that was developed back in the 80s. And now they're trying to go to a multi-tenant cloud solution. I mean, that's a huge jump. And right. so- that second example is probably going to spend more than 15% or they probably should spend more than 15% of their, um, of their effort on change management. Um, this sort of ties back to the executive question too. the, mm -hmm. the first part of the executive question of how do you convince executives? Um, I tend to like to use sort of the, um, and I don't know if you know this, Kyler, there's, a, I think we've talked about it before on this podcast, but there's a book called love and logic for parenting. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
you, you must be familiar with that as a, as a parent. Oh, but, yeah, obviously. Yeah. That's a, a, you know, a baseline to understanding how to parent. <laughs> it's a, right. A Bible, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So when I first met my wife, or I shouldn't say when I first met her, when I first realized that we were probably going to get married, mm -hmm. she had kids. I didn't. So I'd never been a parent. So that was the first thing I did is I read Love and Logic to figure out, you know, what the heck I was going to do as a, as a parent because I had no idea what I was doing. And sometimes I still don't, but that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother story. But the reason I bring up Love and Logic is that's sort of like how you have to be with executives. You have to sort of give them choice. And for those that don't know, Love and Logic is about choices and consequences and letting kids feel like they're in control in some way, but but also showing what the consequences and the options are. Um, and that's the same thing with executives. You have to give them options. So in the examples I had, you know, the big extreme example from green screen to multi-tenant cloud versus the more incremental change. A lot of times when when organizations or executives say, well, we don't want to invest in change management or change management isn't going to be important, then you sort of force them into a decision of, okay, we don't have to invest that heavily in change management. Yeah. Maybe we don't want to invest 15, 20, 25 percent of our budget in change management. Then what we need to do if we want to be effective is we need to throttle back on our expectations of how much we're really going to change. And so maybe we pursue more of an incremental, um, more targeted change approach and you sort of give them that choice. You can't have both. You can't have the big, massive change and a super cheap, thin change management budget. At least you can't have both if you if you want to be successful. Right. So you let them choose, and you and then it becomes their project. They're sort of setting this, the the vision and the expectation for the project, and then ultimately that helps you define a change strategy that that best aligns with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you hit on something really important: is understanding that subculture and the overall psychology of your executive team. Some systems have a, a very, or some organizations have a really rigid executive team that's really data focused. So you need to break these out and saying these are all the different scenarios from data points and measurements. Some are very culturally focused. So you want to do more of that um, qualitative analysis when it comes to change management. But either way, we we talk a lot about the marriage of organizational change management and communication along with psychology practices. Okay, we're here having a great discussion about organizational change management, taking live audience questions. We're going to continue the conversation when we, when we return. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 80. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham, and we're having a great conversation with our live audience, talking about organizational change management and taking some of the audience questions as well. And, and recently with another, you know, mom in, in digital transformation here, uh, we did a change management uh, TikTok series where we were in the car with our kids. And we talked about like how change may, I have two toddlers. So, you know, you have to, we talked about things like misaligning expectations <laughs> and all of those yeah. things while the kids and dogs were in, you know, in the back just running around. But I do think that that it does go into a lot of um, life type of humanizing. Um, I think Katam said in our comments here about um, remembering that your executive panel or steering committee when it comes to digital transformation, they're people too. They, they want this to be successful. Everyone wants uh, this to be successful. So aligning on that. Um, so don't let that, yeah, right here, that don't let that upper management intimidate you, uh, be able to have that conversation so that, that you can set that baseline for, for success. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I know um, Hatem also said what you had up a little bit earlier is, is Gartner um, recommends 15% minimum of overall budget. So that seems to be, you know, the, the, um, the benchmark there. So See, I told you it was someone incredible. I knew it was, even if it wasn't um, pro. I knew it was someone that <laughs> has a credible organization that said. Yeah, 
and we have a lot of you know um, uh, former gardener um, staff members here at, at Third Stage that do um, our consulting. So we use a lot of their great information and resources as well when it comes to advising our, our um, clients. So I want to kind of dig into more of those data points. What are some of the KPIs that you should be measuring when it comes to change management or setting as an ongoing measurement? Um, because we know change management is a journey. It's not, you know, it starts in January and ends in March, those types of things. So I, I want to ask you that, Eric. And then I also want to hear from our audience. If you can pop in the comments um, about uh, what you think would be some of the main key performance metrics to um, measure or key performance indicators for KPIs for change management, we'd love to kind of have you join that conversation too. So Eric, what, what are your thoughts on measuring change management? Yeah, so I, th I see as a couple different layers. One is sort of the, um, you know, the, the high level outcome focused uh, KPI. So in other words, what is it that the overall transformation is trying to accomplish or what is the impact of the organization. So it could be, you know, you going back to your business case and looking at, you know, the inventory reductions that you expect to see or the efficiency gains or the, um, you know, the reduced cycle times, those are very directly related to change management, or at least they should be And your change management strategy and plan should focus on how are we going to enable those metrics that we've defined in our business case or sort of the justification for why we're doing this project. So very important, high level strategic business outcome focused metrics are one layer. Then the other layer below that is more of the, the um, execution focused um, KPIs that you measure during the transformation to see, you know, make sure you're on track to achieve those uh, bigger picture value focused metrics. So that would be this would be things like uh, user adoption levels, you know, as you go through, as you go through the initial training, how, how, um, how have people actually adjusted to this new technology? Are they ready for the implementation? Um, you start to look at things like, um, you know, what, what percentage of jobs have actually been defined and, and communicated to the organization. And, and you start to measure sort of the health of the organizational change efforts, not just to say that, too many times organizational change teams focus on the wrong metrics. They focus on metrics like, well, we held 20 different change impact workshops and that was our goal is to have 20 of them. Well, was that the right number? We don't know. Should you have had 50 of them? You might need less. You might need more. The more important thing is, do people understand the change? And so you start to measure the outcomes that are happening during the project rather than the activities or the inputs into the process. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems of change management is we, we focus on the wrong things. We, we measure all the stuff we did. We don't measure the outcome of what resulted from all the things we did because you might be doing the wrong things. And that's the other thing with change management too, just as a side note, is that it's there's a, there's a huge – change management is a huge discipline. There's so many different things you can do. And in a perfect world, yes, you would do them all and you would invest really heavily in all these different sub work streams and activities. But the reality is, is organizations have limited time and resources. You can't get to it all. So you have to prioritize based on who you are as an organization and what you're trying to accomplish. And you, you know, you focus on a more prescriptive and maybe a little bit more surgical targeted way of change to make sure you hit the really high value stuff. And, um, and so in those cases, or in any case, you want to make sure that those are the right things you're doing, that you're getting the results during the project that will then lead to the results you expect longer term as, as a business. Absolutely. And I think you hit on something that is a, a key issue a lot of times with traditional change management is that it is not a measurement that just happens once or twice. You know, it's a, a measurement that's continuous a, across the organization. And we actually had um, one of our, our guests here on Transformation um, Ground Control was from Lockheed Martin, the head of HR. And he taught us that you can measure trust within an organization and the overall impact of organizational change through um, attrition and retention. You know, are people staying in their jobs? Are they, you know, creating uh, loyalty within the organization? Are, are they content and happy? And a lot of times that can be an, an overall baseline for change management. And that leads me to my next question. And then and then I'll definitely get to some of these, um, these other uh, inputs from our audience here because they're they're great information is what is the relationship between change management effective change management and company culture yeah so 
somewhat related to the previous question, which is, you know, culture is the outcome or the output that you're trying to affect. You have two things you're working with. One is your current culture, the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, you, you probably have some strengths in your current culture, but you probably have some things you're trying to change or some mm-hmm. things that aren't going to support you longer term. But then the other part of that is what is it we want our culture to be and being very clear and deliberate about that change uh, and also being realistic that you're not going to change this culture. If you're a hundred year old organization, you're going to change that culture in a two, three year digital transformation. Mm-hmm. You might start to bend the needle. You might start to move the needle in the right direction, but you're not going to change the culture overnight. But change management change management efforts and initiatives should focus on starting to bend the culture and push the culture a certain mm-hmm. direction. Um, you don't want to break it. In other words, and, and you're, even if you try, you know, all you're going to do is yeah. create other problems if, if you do try to uh, break it or change it too quickly. Um, so, so um, I'm sorry, repeat the question again, sort of what, what is the, the I know you're, it's something to do with culture. You're answering it. Yeah. So the relationship between change management and company culture, because I think a lot of times one of the misses when it comes to change management tactics and initiatives, strategies is the ability of the culture and the readiness of the organization to go through these types of change initiatives and being able to measure that understand it and really be mindful of it because i think a lot of times we go into these executive conversations and because that's not their day-to-day in interacting with their greater workforce they may say oh yeah you know we have no problem with change but there's no data around that there was no surveys done there was no readiness assessment to really showcase are you ready for this change or are you setting yourself up for failure spending a ton of money and then not having any sort of high user adoption rate or a, a disrupt within your organization. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And, and I have to also have as a caveat or a disclaimer, um, I am not a morning person at all. And so we record these uh, live streams uh, early, you know, fairly early in the morning us time. So my brain's only at like 60% capacity. So uh, I'm normal. I, that's why I tend to forget some of these questions, but I'm glad that we're, we're at least staying on track. You're keeping me on track. So thank yeah. you. Don't worry. I'm here for you. I actually thought about this last night as i was watching jurassic park with my son um and of course we were i am always thinking about change management and the pop culture references to that so within jurassic world if you've seen it they create this new hybrid dinosaur that's super scary and there's this scene where the executive goes in to see this dinosaur right and the uh, his assistant said, you know, it's it's very scary. Do you think it's going to scare the kids at the Jurassic Park theme park? And he said, I think it's going to give their parents nightmares. And she said, is that a good thing? <laughs> and he said, yes, the scarier, the better. So obviously within that, um, there is not an alignment when it comes to business objectives. Are we here to scare or entertain people? And that wasn't thought through from a change management and business alignment strategy, because ultimately this dinosaur gets out and, you know, you can you can see what happens from there, just terrorizes the theme park and the entire business goes under. So to, you know, kind of sum that up from a pop culture reference, if you don't think through what the impacts of a change to your organization and your business strategies is going to look like and you're not aligned on that is going to be a dinosaur running through your theme park and completely, you know, ruining your entire business. So. Right. Just, but not in a cool Jurassic Park entertaining sort of well, way. I mean, I don't know that it was cool for anyone actually involved in, in being chased by the dinosaur, but you know, no one thought through those types of, of um, issues, you know, what was going to happen if you completely change the overall mindset and structure of your business so uh, i'm always thinking about change management even when i'm watching you know a movie with <laughs> right. things about dinosaurs so who, who doesn't get, I mean, yeah right right, right? Let's, <laughs> let's get to um and don't even get me on the system side because if they had a system that really managed those and my family's like please stop it's a movie okay it's a movie yeah <laughs> we're just trying to eat dinner and enjoy the movie mom yeah, can like, you please just stop yeah, working exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, but let's get to some of these um, really good uh, feedback here from from um, the overall audience. So uh, I know Gerald uh, said um, some tips is aligning employee KPIs, which we kind of just talked about on the, the scary dinosaur side, performance to digital transformation, easier said than done. So what's your um, 
what's your you know gut reaction to that easier said than done um, type of thing? And how do you set that expectation when it comes to helping clients through the organizational change, employee KPI and performance process? Well, I guess I would challenge that statement a little bit. I, I first of all, I agree that it's easier said than done, but I, you know, I might disagree with whether or not it should be uh, easier said than done. And the reason I say that is because I think the reason it it is difficult for organizations to do to set those clear metrics and and connect the dots between the change management efforts and what the actual business outcomes are they're trying to accomplish, is because the organization itself and the executive team themselves don't have a clear vision of what it is they want. And that's for me, to me, that's the root cause is you don't have alignment, you don't have clarity, you don't have a sense of vision and direction. And if you don't have that, then yes, it's gonna be very difficult to set metrics, you're gonna have a lot of confusion and disagreement as to what those metrics should be, how important they are, whether or not they, you know, connect connect the dots with what you're trying to accomplish as an organization, because you haven't taken that time up front to clearly state what the vision is, what the goals and objectives of the project are, what you want to be when you grow up. The, the organizations that have that clear vision have a lot easier time connecting those dots. And so it become, it, so then the easier said than done comment is less relevant to them because they have taken the time to define that. So I think you have to get to the root cause of that. It's setting the KPIs is relatively easy if you have mm-hmm. that clarity, but the problem is most organizations don't have that clarity vision. They don't have alignment. Um, they haven't thought through what they want this project to be and what they want to be when they grow up. So say that they have, um, for the sake of, of that on the executive side, you know, they have a very polished PowerPoint deck that talks about the pillars of their business, their future goals, those types of things. But often it stops there. It doesn't, it's not communicated or practiced, I would say, within the rest of the organization. How can you make sure that you set your clients up for a communication plan around this change that's going to be effective and that's not going to um, provide any you know, type of resistance within the business? And if it does, how do you address that? Yeah, so... So I think, first of all, you know, you have to be real and pragmatic about what you're trying to accomplish. I think, you know, you and I talk about buzzwords on the podcast all the time and, and our our shared love uh, in a facetious way. Or um, I truly do love buzzwords. I love oh, do, them. Do you? I, I love making, I'm, I love I'm making fun of them. Yeah. <laughs> right. I just like to poke fun at it. But um, but the reason I bring it up is because here's here's the dynamic that plays out. And here's why you know, I think this will answer your question. We sort of show a, a illustration of what happens in the marketplace. Someone at someone at work at an organization decides that they need new technology for whatever reason. They their mm-hmm. system's outdated, they want to scale, whatever. They have a million different reasons why you want you might want new technology. You start reaching out to software vendors and sales reps and system integrators and implementation technical partners. And they all start using these buzzwords, buzzwords like, uh, we're going to future proof your business. That's the one I cannot stand that term. What what in the world does that mean? We're going to future proof your business, or we're going to rethink the art of the possible. Um, okay, that doesn't mean anything. Oh, to I've anyone. never heard of that one before. <laughs> oh, gosh, don't get me started. There's so many like <laughs> lame buzzwords and lame sales tactics. They're highly mm-hmm. effective, I have to say, you know, they're in their defense. Um, but the organization sort of buy into that they think okay we're going to future proof our business um okay well what does that mean like you're going to future proof well we're going to be more nimble and agile okay what does that mean like what what in the world does that mean and what what are the metrics behind that and how are we actually going to transform the business so i think that's the key is to really get below you know all the buzzwords and the noise and get to your business and who you are and what you're trying to be and really setting those metrics um in that way And, and first and foremost more importantly setting the direction with all of your executive team, your key stakeholders, and making sure they're all on the same page. Because a lot of times what happens is they're not on the same page with what this project means and what the priorities are and how they're going to declare victory mm-hmm. and all that stuff. They're just sort of using or parroting back the the sales language like future proof and um, agile and uh, art of the possible, all that sort of garbage that, that gets spouted in our industry. So I don't know if that answers your question yeah. at all. But. Yeah. Okay, we're here having a great discussion about organizational change management, taking live audience questions. We're going to continue the conversation when we when we return. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control.
if you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 80. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham, and we're having a great conversation with our live audience, talking about organizational change management and taking some of the audience questions as well. Well, speaking of garbage that gets <laughs> in our industry, um, I think, uh, I don't know if it's Kevin or Kevon um, here on uh, LinkedIn, but he has a pretty long comment, which I really um, encourage everyone to kind of read. But um, he kind of talks about, to summarize, that a lot of times the issues that organizations come into with change management is through ERP system vendors and saying, hey, we have this template, we have this best practice around um, change management specifically with our system, don't worry about it, we got it. And that's a lot of times where we're called in third stage as an organization because that that's not effective. They have a job that they're very good at it's implementing selling software and managing that system. And we know from having to come into triage organizations when they spend a, a bunch of other money to get their project back on track because their ERP vendor has led them kind of down the wrong path when it comes to change management. So I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that because that's kind of a sweet spot we have here in third stage, unfortunately, right? We never want to go into a business and in that situation, but it happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you have to just, you know, back up and look at the human dynamics and human nature. I mean, you, you have software vendors, system integrators, people that are focused on a single technology and they're not necessarily interested in telling you all the th things that are wrong with the software or all the risks of deploying the mm -hmm. technology. That's not a generally not a good sales tactic, right? Is to say, oh, well, our product's going to create all these problems for you. It's going to create all these risks. It's going to be a change management nightmare for you. That's usually not what organization or what sales reps are going to lead with. They're going to lead with, oh, look at all this cool stuff that the technology does. So, you know, it's understandable why they're sort of, they have this blind spot of cha around change management. And then, you know, usually they'll pay some lip service to change management because most people recognize that we need change management. But the problem is back to our earlier points, not enough people understand what change management really is. So then the sales reps, the, the software vendors, the implementers, they'll sort of pay a little bit of lip service to change management by saying, oh, yeah, we do change management. We'll help you train. We'll train the trainer. We'll train you how to use the technology. Uh, we'll help you put together a communications plan. Well, that's just a tiny, tiny piece of what change management is. And by the way, that's just a real superficial, um, tactical-based view of change management. You haven't gotten into the heart of change management, things like what is the change impact, what is that future state organizational design? How are reporting relationships going to change? Roles and responsibilities. You have to get to that stuff, which, by the way, has really not a lot to do with technology in, other than the fact that the technology does influence and does affect how people's jobs are going to change. But defining roles and responsibilities in the future state organization and the operating model, that is largely – those are largely business decisions, not technology decisions. So um, th it's understandable that they wouldn't focus on that. But organizations go to the software vendors and the sales reps as the experts. They're the ones that understand the technology and they put too much, they defer too much to the software vendors without really not poking holes, but really just thinking outside the box of, okay, software vendor is good at deploying technology, mm -hmm. but now I've got to figure out how to address this change stuff. You know, how do I do all the things I just mentioned to find the future state organization, to find the future state operating model, all that. Absolutely. And, and I think that one key message of understanding the bias in that conversation is that's not a negative thing, right? It just is, it is what it is within any sort of organization. If you have someone from accounting that's on your steering committee, they're obviously going to have a bias of, of the accounting processes and technology. That's not a negative thing. 
It's the same with ERP vendors. As they come in, their job is to make this streamlined for you to sell their software. And and then once you implement it, they kind of fade into the abyss. It's not often an ongoing partnership, though sometimes it can be. But that's why it's important to have that independent, technology agnostic business advisor on your side saying, okay, that's all great, well and, and good with the software side, but we need to understand what you need for your organization for this to be successful. And that's not a template from a software vendor. Um, you know, it would be like trying to, to fit clothes, not all clothes fit a, a specific human body and that's just how it is right but you need to buy the clothes that that fit you that you like that you know matches your style it's the same with organizational change management plans it needs to fit the organization not the erp vendor so definitely an, an important um conversation and i love Hat hatim's comment here garbage in garbage stay that's so true and very sustained <laughs> Um, very, very clear. So I, I like that a lot. Definitely. Yeah. Keep, keep the garbage out of your transformation. If you can, yep. it's going to just, right. just be, Absolutely. be um, more so focused on your operations and your business. And, and you have to get past all the garbage because there is a lot of garbage in this space, it, not just sales reps. It's also just the technology itself. There's just so many bills and bells and whistles and things that organizations aren't realistically going to use. You don't need it. It's not a priority. So don't come complicate the transformation just because the vendor wants to sell you more software. Yeah, absolutely. And again, um, you know, I'll harp home and it's not even on the third stage sales side. Of course, we, we, we'd love to help you, but understanding that this isn't something you don't know what you don't know. And that's exactly right. We talk about the house scenario and metaphor. You, you wouldn't go into your new house and put in all the plumbing. Could you? Maybe, I don't know, but you would call probably a plumber to ensure from that insurance standpoint that you do it correctly because you want to be able to take a shower, to drink water, all of those different things um, within your house effectively. And, and that's what having that independent um, consultant in this space, because they can identify those red flags, which brings me to my next question um, is what are some red flags that your organization change management is on track for failure? Great question. Um, well, some of the leading indicators would be, first of all, if you haven't started change management yet, no matter where you are in the project, um, if, if you've started the project at any point and you haven't really dug into this change management work stream, that's a huge red flag and you, you need to get on that as soon as possible. In fact, to the point where if you need to slow down and push off some of the technology stuff and mm -hmm. get ahead of the change management thing, that's going to be a lot more effective for you know, and time and money much better spent. So that's one is if you don't have, um, if you haven't started the change management stuff, if you haven't done any sort of organizational assessment yet, um, that would be a place to start. Do that organizational assessment. Um, we, we have a process we use at third stage where it's uh, sort of a two-prong approach. One is a quantitative uh, web-based survey analytical tool. The other one's more of a qualitative focus group um, aspect. And you put that together to really get a lay of the land to understand where the challenges and risks are. You benchmark to other organizations and you you put together the change strategy and plan from there and you start executing. If you haven't done that stuff yet, you want to start that now. Again, if you have to push off the technology stuff to get to that, then I would do that. Um, the other thing too is, um, you know, the other, the other red flag or another symptom of lack of change management would be um, one is if uh, like your executive team is not aligned and, and you, and this is just a qualitative thing. This is hard to measure. Um, we have ways that we dig into this and uncover it. But if you as an organization sense that your executive team's not on the same page or they have unrealistic expectations or um, they just don't fully understand what this project is or they can't articulate what this project really means to the organization, that that's a big red flag. And then another one that usually comes a little bit later in the project, and this is a big red flag, is if you see that the project team and the subject matter experts, the stakeholders, are pushing for more customization of the technology or technologies that are being deployed. Um, every organization, for the most part, has some degree of customization they're going to have to do to the technology. But the ones that take it to the extreme, oftentimes that's a symptom of the fact that they're not managing change well. And change management and customization, to me, it's, it's almost like a seesaw. Like if, if you're not investing in change management, customization is probably going to go up and that's going to create a bunch of other problems. Um, if you invest more in change management, that's going to sort of balance that out and push down the need or the want to, to customize. 
not 100% because you're still going to have to customize because no software is perfect. No software aligns perfectly with what you're trying to accomplish. So those are a few, you know, maybe three symptoms that I'd watch for to start would be, um, you know, the, the high customization, lack of alignment or clarity from your executive team, and then not having started change management you know, early in the project. Absolutely. And I think those are all really, really important um, red flags to monitor um, and understand um, and continue to assess throughout your organization, analyze what that's looking like from a qualitative and quantitative perspective. Um, so, to, so to wrap up here, um, I'm going to ask you and I'm going to ask our audience here, can you share a case study of an organization from an autonomous perspective that um, didn't invest in change management and suffered uh, the consequences of doing so? And what can happen if you don't prioritize change management strategies within a digital transformation? Yeah, gosh, I've seen a lot of them. Probably the best case studies are the unfortunate um, mm -hmm. train wreck scenarios like the project recoveries projects and or the expert witness work we do. Um, a lot of our, our revenue as a business comes from expert witness. Um, and that's a growing part of our, one of the growing parts of our business too, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but in those expert witness cases, um, what I can say is I've, you know, we've done probably 30 to 35 cases over the last 10 or 15 years um, where we've been the designated expert to testify in a, in a lawsuit that involves a digital transformation failure. And in every single one of those cases, change management was, was a problem, was, was a root cause. And that's the, in fact, I went back recently uh, a couple of years ago, I went back and looked at past expert witness cases, and that's the only that's the only theme that was common across all of the cases was was lack of change management. Um, and so I could pick any one of those thirty five examples, but I, I think probably the biggest one, the, the most memorable one, one was actually the very first expert witness case I ever did. It was a really big lawsuit. Um, a lot of people listening right now probably have heard of this lawsuit. Um, this was back in like two thousand seven or eight, I think it was. And I didn't even, honestly, at the time, this is a fun little fact. I didn't even know what an expert witness was at the time. I didn't know what that meant um, and, until an attorney called and said, hey, uh, we saw, you know, a blog you wrote or something. Um, do you do expert witness work? I said, I don't know. What, tell me what an expert witness is and I'll tell you if I can do it. Um, anyway, so that was the very first case where I was an expert witness. And it was a, a, it was a lawsuit against one of the big, really big uh, ERP software vendors. And in that case, it was a, it was an organization that, um, was trying to implement um, this big ERP vendor uh, in a in a thirty or no, I'm sorry in an eighteen month period, and this was a massive organization. I think their revenue was tens. It was in the tens of billions of dollars of revenue. They're a large. Um, I can't even tell you what industry it is because it gives it away. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. it, but you know actually, I could probably say it. Uh, well, no, I have confidentiality, so I can't really say it. Um, but it's a it's a. Um, it's, it's a utility of sorts, I guess I'd say. Not, not a power or gas utility, but it's a consumer utility that we all use on a weekly basis to, uh, I don't know. Again, I can't use the word without giving it away. But anyway, this company, massive company, they had like 30 different locations uh, throughout North America, um, or 30 main locations, and then they had a bunch of sub-locations as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're suing a big ERP vendor who comes in and says, we can do this implementation across 30 locations in 18 months. Which right away you look at that and say, okay, there's no way that was ever going to happen in this universe. Um, but that's the proposal they had. And then it turned into a failure three years go by and they still hadn't implemented the first location. So they, mm -hmm. had, they had committed to 18 months, all 30 locations, three years go by. They hadn't even, they couldn't even get the one location, the first location to go live. Then they filed a lawsuit. So the reason I'm kind of getting into the backdrop here is that's that was the outcome that was the end result was a big massive failure they spent like three times the budget they expected took twice as long and they still didn't even get anywhere close to finishing but then when you as an expert witness you you get to see everything that happened in that project everything from project mm -hmm. statuses steering committee readouts you know you can see the code of what was being done on the technical side the change management plans every email that went back and forth to anyone in the organization related to that project you get access mm -hmm. to all these emails you learn way too much about people that you don't necessarily need or want to know. But one of the things we did learn in this in our sort of forensic analysis of this train wreck was that the organization at the top, the executive level, was just a mess. There were is a really highly political organization. There's a lot of backstabbing and, and uh, infighting. They couldn't agree on what whose whose fault this was and what they were trying to be. 
And, and again, I pointed at change management because that right there at, at the top level was a sign that this project was never going to succeed. It didn't matter what vendor was involved. This project was not going to succeed because that company was such a mess. And I don't know that, uh, honestly, I, I don't know that any amount of change management could have fixed how broken this organization was mm -hmm. and maybe they still are, um, but they didn't invest any sort of effort in change management. And so um, that's probably the, the biggest case study uh, that I, or the the most extreme case study that yeah. I can think of. And so, you know, you end up, you, you end up with all these really unhealthy dynamics where everyone's throwing each other under the bus project gets delayed. They start pointing fingers, they're firing people left and right, but it still doesn't fix anything. Um, it gets to the point where, you know, you read all these emails and you, as I, I remember feeling really bad for the people that were on this project because they were just set up for failure. Um, yeah. Not just because of change management, there's other stuff too, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And it sounds like we've got some similar um, experience here in the comments. Um, you know, Hatem said under underestimating scale and scope of um, change management, neglected stakeholders, which you're kind of talking about poor communication, again, um, and active resistance and active silos. And that that can often be the hardest thing to kind of unearth, especially as a project leader, because you really have to get granular and open that door to transparency on that feedback loop, or you won't even know that resistance exists until it's really too late. Um, and then Chris also on LinkedIn said, my experience wasn't that there was no change management, but the executives didn't understand the role. The change manager was inexperienced and ended up doing all sorts of roles that they should have been nowhere near. And that can happen too, especially in not understanding the culture or not being honest about the culture, I think is the biggest thing. You know, it's not a bad thing to say like, hey, you know, our culture isn't exactly built for this type of large change. You know, we have a very entrepreneurial cowboy culture and that's how we've gotten to this high growth, but we don't have any standardization. We don't really have, um, you know, we have a ton of tribal knowledge. That's fine. You know, it's better to be aware and say that up front so that you can better set your, yourself up for success as opposed to, you know, saying that you're going to be a, a perfect culture for new technology because you're an innovator. And sometimes being an innovator, and that's why Eric and I work here, isn't always a great thing on the, <laughs> on the standardization side. Um, right. So it's it's not a, a, a bad thing to say, you know, that that's something that you, you might um, interact with within your change management strategy. So with that, any... Any final thoughts or, or some number one best practices that you'd recommend for our audience here on the change management side or understanding the impact for their organization? Sure. So I'd say the, the first thing is that um, if I were to sort of leave some closing thoughts, one is that change management is almost always more difficult and change in general is almost always more difficult than organizations and project teams realize. Um, that's one. Um, Secondly is, you know, start change management as soon as possible. The sooner you start, the better. Change management is usually on the critical path to completion of a transformation. Uh, in other words, if it's usually the longest uh, duration activity in a project plan, the technology stuff is usually one of the shorter uh, work streams. So the sooner you start on the change management, the sooner you're going to start your project, the more effective it's going to be, the cheaper you're going to implement. So that 15% metric we shared earlier, you may spend 15% on change management, but you're probably going to save a lot more than that in in uh, mitigating or, or avoiding those overruns and the problems that result from not having invested in change management. And then the third thing I'd say is this is more of a tip to just get started because I know change management is such a broad, big thing. It means a lot of different things. And just understanding the magnitude of change in your organization can be very difficult. You can start yeah. simple. You don't need to take a shotgun approach and just go start doing a bunch of change management stuff. Start by doing an organizational assessment wherever you are in the project. Um, you know, do the assessment of where you are now, where you're trying to get, where the organizational pitfalls are, and then create a change strategy and plan that really prioritizes the most important things for you to do. And there might be some things you don't get to, you know, some of the lower priority stuff, but at least you know you've hit on the the highest priority change management stuff. So start small with that assessment, and that's going to give you a lot more clarity and direction on how you would approach change management. And of course, you know, us at third stage, we specialize in this stuff. It's where I started my career. It's where a lot of us started our careers at third stage. So this is something that we do um, either as part of a, an implementation that we're supporting, or in some cases, as you mentioned, Kyler, 
we have some clients that hire us just to do the change management mm -hmm. stuff, starting with that organizational assessment. Absolutely. And hopefully, um, you know, we can create some excitement and positivity around just the exercise of getting to know your organization, especially on an executive level. There is nothing more important than really researching what you become. And even if you're the CEO and founder and you, you built it from the ground up, that's great. But you have an entirely new workforce that you now have an opportunity to not only enhance from new technology, create growth and be more efficient, but you also have the opportunity to really get to know your organization and point the compass from a cultural standpoint to where you want to be or what you want to do. And that that takes that knowledge is power approach through those granular assessments that you just um, mentioned. Um, yep, I agree. Those were great questions from the audience. And thank you, Kyler, for such good questions as well. Um, great conversation. There's a lot more we could have talked about uh, in that segment, but hopefully that gives the audience a, a starting point to work from as it relates to organizational change management. When we come back from a quick break, we're going to talk a little bit more about change management, unpack some of the, the threads and themes uh, from that conversation. But first, we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 80. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham, and we just had a great audience conversation, Q&A, related to organizational change management. What were some of your takeaways from that conversation, Kyler? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what great audience engagement. We obviously have a lot of change practitioners and people that have experience with change management, and also some great questions um, when it came to just change management initiatives in general. Um, I wish we could have gotten to all of the questions, but we did have um, some really interesting ones. Around, um, the ERP vendor space, we kind of touched on, right? What does that look like? But then other people asked, what are some um, tips and tricks that you can utilize to understand when your ERP vendor is not going to be successful in change management? So that's one thing I wanted to ask you as a follow-up. Yeah, it's, and I think we sort of touched on that a little bit with one of the questions, but uh, there was other questions, you're right, that, that we're asking more directly about that. Um, but I think, you know, the general thing, first of all, is to maybe, I hate to say lower your expectations, but to just recognize that ERP vendors, system integrators, implementation partners, value-added resellers, basically any party that focuses on implementing a certain technology, you have to assume that they're not going to be strong at anything other than what they're good at, which is to implement and deploy technology. And one of those things that they're typically not good at is organizational change management. Now, when you press them on this, they'll typically say the same typical stuff, which is like, which is usually, oh yeah, we do do change management. We do training, we mm -hmm. do communications. And I, I think we, we talked about that in the, in the discussion uh, or in the panel. Um, but you just have to recognize the full picture of what change management is and know that they do have a role in change management, but they're not going to manage the entire change initiative for you. Most, most of these, even the big system integrators don't do that well. They're specialized in, and they make their money on selling and deploying technology. So the key is to figure out what do we do? How do we plug that gap? It doesn't necessarily change your uh, use of the system integrator or the software vendor. You're still going to use them, but don't expect them to be something that they're not. So then the question becomes, how do you plug that gap with other, other resources, either third party and or internal resources to help you manage those changes. And what about speaking of filling that 
gap, something like a user adoption platform? Is that something you you utilize a lot of times within your change strategies to help kind of make sure that you maximize the business value of the new technology? Yeah, great point. And something that um, it just didn't pop in my head and we didn't we didn't get to in the conversation with with the panel mm-hmm. or with the, the audience questions. But it is, we have a, uh, you know, third stage, we have a a technology agnostic digital adoption tool that we use for whatever system or systems you're deploying, or even for, for legacy systems, for that matter, if you've got adoption issues with systems you already have in in place, we have a a user adoption tool that we use uh, to help enable that. So, and there's other, you know, there's other uh, digital adoption tools out there, but again, you want to focus on not just what the software vendor provides in terms of user adoption, because Mm -hmm. typically their solution is just one part of the overall technology right. stack and one part of the overall transformation. So having something that's agnostic that can provide user adoption, not just for their technology, but for the entire process changes, organizational changes and all that stuff, that that's super important as well. Yeah, definitely. And something that can um, really be used as a resource. You know, we talk about learning management styles and those types of things, specifically when you talk about uh, training or communicating uh, to different employees this type of platform gives them access to that information on, on their time and their speed, uh, depending on how you know savvy they are with the, the new tech or familiar with the system. So definitely yeah. an, an interesting change technology. And I know of a few other um, change management technologies we've, talk, we've talked about in the past on this podcast, such as nudge technology or, or um, those employee collaborations. So I think there is a place for those independent systems to be able to not only uh, push user adoption, maximize business value, but also help to support the employee that's going through the change and create some collaboration around the company culture and embracing this exciting new technology. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of times, um, you know, I even felt like in that conversation, organizational change can be a negative thing. And the fact that it's really scary, it's kind of intangible, hard to define, and really unique to each organization. Um, so being able to do it right seems like kind of a secret sauce, which it totally is. It's a competitive advantage, but it hope that from that conversation, uh, different stakeholders can embrace the option or the, the opportunity to be able to create change within their business environments. Yeah, yeah, and you need... You need a, a number of different stakeholders internally. They're involved in that. You need them to be the face of change. You need uh, the leadership behind that. And you know, when even when we're involved with with clients and in helping them through the change management process, we can't replace that. You know, and to yeah. be effective, you shouldn't want anyone outside your organization to be the face of change. You can have organizations like Third Stage provide the framework, the approach, the analytical tools, the guidance, the behind the scenes, behind the curtain sort of uh, direction, but you do need those internal leaders and stakeholders to be the the face of change within the organization for sure. Absolutely. Well, what a fun conversation. Um, you know, those Q and A's, I, I appreciate everyone's great questions. And um, as always, those live streams are a great opportunity to jump on there in real time um, and ask your questions about the specific uh, dialogue that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And uh, yeah, great conversation. Thank you again for everyone who, who, submitted questions and apologies to all the questions we didn't get to. There's probably, there may have been more questions we didn't answer than the ones we did. Uh, but keep, keep, uh, stay tuned to this podcast. We'll have more episodes to talk about change management for sure. Cause it's uh, a recurring theme for certain. Always. Always. <laughs> yep. Well, good. Well, we're going to shift gears and uh, take a break. When we come back, we are going to play for you a clip of a YouTube video that we published not too long ago. That is, the ranking, the independent ranking of the top 10 ERP systems of 2023. So as you start thinking about your digital transformation, your ERP initiatives in the new year, although it's probably way too early to be talking about the new year, but next year, uh, most organizations are planning now for initiatives and uh, software evaluations and potential implementations that would start in 2023. So now's the time to be thinking about that if you haven't already. And to do that, we thought we'd play you a clip of our top 10 ranking of ERP systems for 2023. We're going to do that, but first we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. 
Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 80. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham, and you can find new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and all the audio podcast platforms. Be sure to check out past episodes of this show and subscribe if you haven't already. And I uh, thought we'd shift gears a bit here as organizations start thinking about their digital technology initiatives in 2023 and beyond. It's time to start thinking about what sorts of technology should we be considering. And every year we do uh, an independent ranking at Third Stage Consulting. We do an independent ranking of the different software solutions in the marketplace, including ERP systems, but also including uh, CRM, human capital management, supply chain management, business intelligence, all sorts of different types, types of tools and rankings and reviews that we do of these different technology solutions. And we publish that each year in a annual digital transformation report, which we just recently published for 2023. So... You can download that 2023 Digital Transformation Report, by the way, in the link below. We've included a link in the description for this episode, for this podcast. But what we thought we'd do in addition to sharing that link with you is to really unpack the details behind our top 10 ranking. And the top 10 ranking this year is pretty interesting, partly because we have a new number one. We have a couple new entrants in the top 10, and then we had a couple solutions that fall out of the top 10 for this year compared to, to the past or the last ranking that we did. So what we thought we'd do is play you this YouTube clip. It's from my YouTube channel um, on YouTube. And you can find the other rankings out there if you want to watch the videos of other top 10 rankings. I have all those top 10 rankings out there on my YouTube channel. So if you don't already follow me there or subscribe to me, be sure to check that out on YouTube. Uh, but here's a clip from the top 10. We'll kind of walk through the top 10 ranking here. And then uh, Kyler and I will unpack it and answer some questions. After the fact. So with all that being said, here is the top 10 ranking for 2023. Before I jump into the top 10, though, I want to talk about the methodology we used. The methodology we use is based on our customers' experience with these different systems. So we evaluate and help clients implement all types of different solutions across a number of different industries. So we look at things like overall functionality, the maturity of the system, the ease of integration, the flexibility, the overall customer adoption rate. Those are just a few of the criteria we use to identify what are those best systems in the marketplace. And the other caveat I'll add is that this is a general ranking. So you might have very specific needs in a very specific industry that might shuffle or scramble this top 10 list for your specific needs. So the idea here is to provide a general top 10 ranking based on general needs across multiple industries and geographies throughout the world. So let's just jump right into the top 10 list. Coming in at number 10 is Acumatica. Acumatica is a software vendor that was not in our top 10 list last year, but is a new entry into our top 10 list this year. And the reason Acumatica has emerged as an up and coming player is largely because they've defined a very clear niche in the marketplace. They tend to focus on manufacturing distribution organizations. The product has a very clear user interface and the pricing model is very conducive to the small and mid market, especially if you're a low volume high margin type of manufacturing or distribution company, it can be a very cost effective solution with a very high ROI. And the reason for that is because they have a very unique pricing model where they price based on transaction volumes. So if you have a lot of high volume, low margin types of products, it may not be a good fit, but if you have a moderate to low volume, but higher margin types of products, it can actually be very cost effective for organizations. In addition to the extensive user interface, there's also R&D dollars that are being pumped into the product via private equity firm that just bought the firm not too long ago. And that's always a good sign of a product that's up and coming when there's private equity money behind it. So you combine all these things together and that's a reason to put Acumatic. Coming in at number nine is Salesforce and Financial Force. 
Now, this is a product that's actually dropped a couple of notches in our ranking from last year. Not so much because the product itself has changed or gotten less desirable, but because there's other vendors that have made bigger strides and bigger advancements and we've seen greater success with than Salesforce. But having said that, it's important to note that many people view Salesforce as purely a CRM system, but really Salesforce and Financial Force and Force.com platform, that all has become somewhat of a ERP platform for general ERP capabilities, even outside of CRM. So I mentioned Financial Force on the financial side, you have extensions like Rootstock, which is a vendor that's built on Salesforce that provides manufacturing ERP capabilities just to name two examples of products that provide ERP-like capabilities. Now, Salesforce is a good fit for organizations that might be looking for more of a best of breed and a flexible type of solution, where they can bolt on different types of systems, different modules to meet different needs as the organization grows. But along with that comes a dark side, which is that a lot of organizations find that that flexibility can create a lot more complexity in terms of integration and cost. It also puts more pressure on your IT department to maintain that system. So. Those are some things to think about, but in general, that's enough to land Salesforce and Financial Force at number nine on our list. Coming in at number eight on our list is Odoo. And Odoo is an open source ERP system. It's new to our top 10 list, although you may recall seeing it on our top 10 list of ERP systems for small business. This year, it made the general top 10 list, largely because we've seen it scale for some mid-sized organizations as well and for the general functionality and capabilities that the product has expanded to in recent years. So just to hone in on this open source concept, open source can be a good thing in terms of a price tag for the software licensees, but the downside is that as you start to add on different modules and different capabilities, that number can actually go up, that price tag can actually increase. The other downside of Odoo is that it can be complex to maintain. So if you don't have a fairly sophisticated and mature IT department that can maintain the complexities of an open source system that just requires more IT sophistication, that can be a downside as well. It can also be a downside when it comes to scaling for large organizations, but for small and mid-market organizations, Odoo can be a very good fit, especially if you're looking for something with maximum flexibility and maximum modularity to be able to tie together different modules uh, within the organization. So with all that being said, that's enough to land Odoo at number eight on our list. Coming in at number seven is Sage X3, which is a product that fell a couple notches from last year's ranking. Again, not so much because Sage X3 is less desirable than it was before, but because other vendors have made further advancements in their product. But Sage X3 in general is a great product. It's a core financial system. It's great for manufacturing and distribution types of organizations, as well as organizations that aren't in manufacturing and distribution. It's a good tier two alternative to some of the bigger ERP vendors in the marketplace. And some of the downside risks of the product include a couple things. One is that we find it's not as scalable for really large and complex organizations as some of the other products in our top 10 list. So if you're a larger, more sophisticated global organization, it may test the boundaries of your organization. And the second thing is the user interface isn't quite as clean or user friendly as some of the other systems in the marketplace. But with all that being said, that's enough to land Sage X3 at number seven on our list. Coming in number six on our list is Infor Cloud Suite. This is a product that's actually moved up in our ranking this year. And one caveat I have to throw out there though is that the Infor Cloud Suite umbrella is very broad and it may be a bit misleading because there's actually multiple systems within the Infor Cloud Suite umbrella. They're trying to brand or rebrand the product as Cloud Suite, but you still have the segments of different products that they work with. Now, M3 is a product that we often see in manufacturing situations. We also see Infor Sightline as one of the solutions that we see in manufacturing types of environments. And then there's also Infor Nexus, which is a supply chain management solution and actually one of our top 10 supply chain management systems in the market. And the reason I bring up these three different solutions is because Infor Cloud Suite involves a lot of different systems. And the system within the Cloud Suite umbrella that's best for you is gonna depend on your needs. But in general, when we look at the Infor Cloud Suite umbrella, we find that it has a great robust and wide variety of business processes and capabilities that fit a lot of different situations, especially organizations that are in manufacturing and distribution, but we also see Infor being used by a lot of non-manufacturing organizations as well. They also have a lot of R&D dollars as a result of Coke Industries putting in a lot of money into the acquisition of the company. And now the downside of Infor though, just like every product in our top 10 list, they have a downside as well. The downside with Infor is largely the product roadmap 
just understanding which of these systems to piece together to give you the solution you need, that can be very confusing. It can be very daunting. And it's important to really make sure you're honing in on the right solution, whether it's M3 or Sightline or Nexus or some of the other solutions that they offer. So that's one thing. The other thing is the cost of the solution it tends to be a bit higher than some of the others that we've covered so far in our top 10 list. But having said that, those cost differences can oftentimes be negotiated away. But with all that being said, that's enough to land in for Cloud Suite at number six on our list. All right, we're in the middle of our top 10 countdown of the top 10 ERP systems for 2023. We're going to continue with the top five uh, as soon as we come back from a quick break. But in the meantime, you're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 80. We are here going through the top 10 systems or ERP systems for 2023, which by the way, you can also find in our 2023 digital transformation report, uh, which we've included a link to below. So be sure to check that out. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and roll the top five systems for 2023. Coming in at number five on our list is IFS. And IFS was in our top five last year. It actually dropped just one slot to number five this year. It's a great product, strong enough to finish in our top five. And the reason it is in our top five is because it is a very focused solution. It's not trying to be everything to everyone and it tends to focus on industrial manufacturing and distribution types of companies. So if you're a company that has a lot of project management or asset management or maintenance and repair types of functions, IFS is a very good fit. Now, the reason it fell from number four to number five is largely because it's such a narrow focus which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but when we're looking at a broad general ranking like this one, there's other solutions that can provide broader capabilities to meet a number of different clients' needs. But if you're one of the organizations that fit within that sweet spot of IFS, you might actually put IFS at number one on your list. So it's a matter of understanding what those strengths of the product are relative to your needs. And it has a good user interface. There's a lot of R&D dollars being spent on the product itself. And the organization is also focusing on expanding its value added reseller network, its network of implementation partners, if you will. So those are some up and coming aspects of IFS that I think will prove that it has a very bright future. Now, the downside of the product is that it could be a little more expensive than some of the solutions in the marketplace. We find that dollar for dollar, you're going to spend a bit more on IFS, but you may be getting better capabilities if it's the right fit for you. And then the other big downside of IFS is largely perception based, which is that a lot of organizations haven't heard of IFS. They're a European based company. They have a good presence in Europe and they're still expanding and still trying to increase their market share in other parts of the world. So as far as referenceability and having peers that use the product, you're not going to have as many peers using IFS as maybe some of the other products in our top 10 list, but that's not necessarily a terrible thing either. So all that being said is enough to land IFS at number five on our list. Coming in at number four on our list is SAP S4 HANA. It's actually moved up a couple slots from last year, largely because they're starting to get some traction and momentum on building that maturity that they've struggled with for the last few years since HANA was released several years ago. Now, S4 HANA is very strong in financials, inventory management, sort of your vanilla basic ERP functionality. So it's really one of the best when it comes to financial flexibility and financial capabilities, GL capabilities, product costing, all that stuff. Now, where S4 HANA tends to struggle is once you get outside the core and you start to look at other advanced capabilities like manufacturing or advanced planning, product lifecycle management, even some of the CRM capabilities are lacking. So it's still not as mature of a product as it could be and will be someday. And it's certainly not as mature of a product as the old ECC product was or even R3, which are the old 
legacy SAP products. So that's probably the biggest thing holding back the product. Now on the flip side, there are some maturity issues with some of the expanded capabilities, but what SAP has done to partially address that is to go acquire other companies. So they've acquired products like Ariba on the procurement side of things, success factors on human capital management, Concur as it relates to time and expense. So they've become somewhat of a best of breed provider, but with that comes a dark side, which is now you have multiple systems that you need to tie together. So the SAP roadmap is still a bit kludgy. It's a bit hard to navigate in terms of understanding what products might be the right fit for you within the SAP umbrella. But having said all that, just based on history and based on SAP's track record, especially with the larger, more complex organizations, I'm fairly confident that SAP will get there and S4HANA will get there soon enough. And we actually have seen a significant amount of progress here in the last couple of years as it relates to that. So having said all that, that's enough to land SAP S4HANA at number four on our list. Coming in at number three on our list is Oracle ERP Cloud, which along with SAP is one of the gold standards for larger Fortune 1000 types of organizations. And when we compare Oracle to SAP Cloud and really just to explain why Oracle is ahead of SAP, it's largely because Oracle is a more flexible product. It's something that can be tailored more easily than S4 HANA can be in general. It struggles with a lot of the same things that SAP struggles with with S4 HANA in that Oracle ERP Cloud is still a work in progress. There's still a lot of advanced manufacturing capabilities that aren't baked into the system yet. And there's still a lot of missing components of Oracle ERP Cloud. But having said all that, Oracle ERP Cloud is, is a very broad and robust product that can meet a lot of different industry needs, especially if you're a diversified, larger, more complex organization. And if you value flexibility and ease of integration, Oracle can be a great fit. So with all that in mind, that's enough to land Oracle ERP Cloud at number three on our list. Coming in at number two is last year's number one solution, which is Oracle NetSuite. And still a very solid, respectable ranking at number two in our top 10 list, but it did drop. And the reason for that is largely because we're seeing some concerning trends with NetSuite. But let me start with the positive things. The positive aspects of Oracle NetSuite are, first of all, that it's one of the pioneer software as a service types of solutions. So it's been in the cloud for 20 years, well before all the other vendors try to play catch up. So they have a very mature solution that's been in the cloud the entire time it's been around. It was built for the cloud. It has an architecture built for the cloud as well. It also focuses on small and mid market companies. So if you're a fairly vanilla small and mid market company and you're looking to upgrade from QuickBooks or your basic accounting system, NetSuite can be a logical next step in your evolution through the digital transformation. Now, the downside of Oracle NetSuite is, first of all, the pricing is fairly high, especially for a small and mid-sized organization. It can actually be pretty costly in the long term because you have a recurring subscription model with a lot of hidden costs that can actually escalate over time. The other downside that really held it back from being in the number one slot is that we're starting to see more issues with implementations with Oracle NetSuite. And this is just strictly a hypothesis, but my theory is that Oracle, since they acquired NetSuite, has gotten so aggressive with pushing further into the small and mid-market, but also pushing upstream to larger organizations. It seems as though they may be getting over their heads in some cases with where they're selling Oracle NetSuite. So that's something to keep in mind as well, is making sure that you understand whether or not Oracle NetSuite really can meet your needs and that you're getting an agnostic view of that evaluation. And then the final thing that really holds back Oracle NetSuite is the fact that it does have a lack of flexibility when compared to other systems in the marketplace. So if you don't like the way NetSuite was built, it's very hard to change when you compare it to say a Microsoft E365 or an Oracle ERP cloud, or even some of the other systems in the marketplace. So that lack of flexibility relative to the other systems is partially what holds it back. But again, very solid, respectable number two on our top 10 ranking for this year. Coming in at number one is a new number one, very different from last year, which is last year's number two system, and that is Microsoft D365. The primary reason why D365 is number one is partially because there's two different solutions that D365 offers. There's Business Central, which is built for small and mid-market companies, those with more vanilla or straightforward requirements. And then there's Finance and Operations, which is for larger, more complex organizations. So you have two distinctly different systems meeting distinct needs of different types of organizations. But on top of that, you also have the flexibility and the user interface of Microsoft. A lot of organizations are comfortable with that user interface. 
A lot of organizations value the flexibility that D365 provides, especially when you compare it to, say, an Oracle NetSuite or an SAP S4 HANA. Microsoft D365 can be a lot more flexible. Now, the dark side to this, though, is that just because you can change the D365 system doesn't mean you should. And a lot of organizations get tripped up during the implementation because they try to over-customize or over-change the system the way it was meant to be used. The other appealing factor of Microsoft Dynamics is the fact that it's so easy to integrate with other systems and that it has that Microsoft look and feel. Those are some of the common reasons why many of our clients opt to go with D365. Now, one last dark side that I'll throw in here, even though they're number one on our list, the biggest dark side of using D365 is their value-added reseller network. It is a complete mess. There are just way too many providers out there that are selling D365, they're implementing D365, but they may or may not be qualified to do so. I'd say of all the vendors in our top 10 list, Microsoft probably has the least amount of control and oversight of their reseller network. And that's a big problem when it comes to implementation. So if you do choose Microsoft Dynamics 365, just know that the product itself may be ranked number one on our list. But when you choose the implementation partner, you want to make sure you look carefully at the options you have, because that whole ecosystem has a high degree of variability in the competencies in terms of the implementation providers. So all that being said is enough to land Microsoft D365 at number one on our list. So while we just shared the top 10 list with you, there's a lot more systems that didn't make our top 10 list than did. Some examples include two vendors that were in our top 10 list last year, but fell out of the top 10. And those are ServiceNow and Workday. And it's not so much that those products are inferior compared to the other top 10, but they are just not as complete of an ERP product as the others in our top 10. That's the main reason. The other reason why Workday fell out of the top 10 is largely because we're seeing a lot of implementation issues with, with customers that are implementing the product. I don't know how much of that is a reflection of the product itself versus the implementers trying to implement the product, but either way, it's enough to knock Workday out of the top 10. And ServiceNow is, is somewhat of a myopically focused solution that can be used for ERP purposes or ERP light purposes, but it's not a true robust ERP system as many of the other vendors are. In addition to those two systems that fell out of our top 10, there's a whole host of other systems that are great products that you could argue should be in the top 10. So you have products like Epicor, which is a product that's very strong in the manufacturing and distribution space. You have a product called DCOM, which focuses on process manufacturing. You have Aptian, which is a great product portfolio with a lot of private equity investment behind it. So those are just a few examples of some of the products that didn't make the top 10. But what I'll note is that even if a product didn't make the top 10, doesn't mean it's not in your top 10 or shouldn't be on your shortlist. So be sure you take this all with a grain of salt and really look to your specific requirements to understand where you could use the most help and where the technology can help you the most. Okay, so that was the top 10 ranking of top ERP systems for 2023. Curious to hear the audience's thoughts on this, but uh, Kyler, I'm sure you'll have some questions and some things you want to talk about. So we'll get to those questions when we come back from a quick break. But first, we'll take that break and you're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 80. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham, and we just played for you the top 10 rankings of the top 10 systems, uh, ERP systems for 2023. It's important because the technology is changing so quickly, especially nowadays where uh, not only are there are more advancements in technology in general, things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and predictive analytics and things like that, mm -hmm. but also because so many vendors right now are still making that transition from their on-premise solutions mm -hmm. to their cloud solutions. 
And so there's just so much change in the space right now that more than ever, uh, you really want to keep a pulse on what the, the strengths and weaknesses of these different solutions are. For sure. No, that makes a, a lot of sense. And as always, when you say in, in these types of, of content rankings, you know, you really have to know what your business strategies are, your requirements and your overall capabilities as far as a need. You do have um, a few other cloud-based systems now included in the list. Do you feel like that is um, a benefit to be able to now offer a SaaS solution? And is that why some of those got reshuffled or were higher in the ranking? Yeah, I mean, like like you said at the beginning of the segment, it depends. I mean, it depends on what you value as an organization. If you're, yeah. you know, a smaller, less mature organization, and you're looking for just just some common sense business processes that you can use for your business and common sense workflows within technology, then SaaS could be a great fit. It could be a great way to sort of start that journey. Uh, but for a larger, more mature organization that has well-established processes for better or for worse, mm -hmm. uh, that SaaS model, the cloud and SaaS model is oftentimes more painful for those organizations. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say it's better or worse. I, I guess I'd say that when you look at companies or, or products like NetSuite, or Workday or Salesforce, those pure SaaS solutions that have been in SaaS for decades now. Uh, or when I say SaaS, it's software as a service, yeah. subscription-based, multi-tenant, meaning that every organization that uses NetSuite, Salesforce, Workday is using essentially the same version of the software. Mm -hmm. They're just making minor configurations to the software to fit their personal needs. And then they're obviously loading their own data that's protected and not shared with others. But the the software, the base of the software itself is the same for for uh, most, if not all organizations. So that model is highly scalable. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot easier to deploy from a technical perspective. The vendors like it because it's easier to maintain. Investors love it because it's high margin, steady recurring mm -hmm. subscription revenue. So everyone loves it. For the most part, the question is, does the organization implementing it? Do they love it? And uh, you may or may not, depending on what your needs are. So I wouldn't say right now, SaaS is better or worse. You know, you could give me a, if you gave me like three different, case studies or three different examples mm -hmm. of different companies and what their goals and objectives were, I'd probably come up with a totally different top 10 list for each of those oh, absolutely. individual organizations. So that's the challenge of this is coming up with a general top 10 that's sort of generalized yeah. representing the average, if you will. Is there one system that really surprised you this year um, in either coming onto the list, coming off of the list or moving up into the list? Well, it was a bit of a surprise, not a surprise so much, but, but just, you know, a, a bit of a rethinking of the, of the top 10 list where ServiceNow and um, Salesforce both fill out of the top mm -hmm. 10, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, although we just watched it, I should recall, but um, I, I believe those two were the two that fell out. And I actually question that, you know, there is part of me that thinks that actually they mm -hmm. should have moved up, especially ServiceNow because they, right. they're more of a platform and they're more of a, you know, kind of a, um, just a common platform that can tie together multiple systems and work mm -hmm. with within multiple systems. So for some that, that might actually rank really high. Same as Salesforce. Salesforce has the force, the force platform with all the third party apps and uh, mm -hmm. integrations and things like that for different industries. So, um, you know, the reason they fell off those because they're not traditional ERP systems yeah. in, the, in the traditional sense, but, um, but I would argue maybe that's not important to, I would say that it's not, important to all organizations for it to be a traditional ERP system. That might actually be a good thing for a lot of organizations. So again, you hear me kind of, if you hear, if you sense any wavering, it's because I can argue so many different angles on yeah. this, depending on what the needs are of the, of the organization. Absolutely. And, and that's, I assume why you do a lot of your um, industry specific category specific top 10 lists too, so that you can feature some of, of those uh, additional systems that might be more of a, a niche area. Yeah, absolutely. So like Salesforce, you see it's well positioned in the top 10 CRM systems. Um, we haven't done a top 10 lit ranking of like just SaaS systems yeah. or a top 10 ranking of that. platforms, you know, where you might look at ServiceNow and Force, uh, the Salesforce platform. Uh, Palantir, uh, things of that nature, but we we probably will over time. It's just we're continuously yeah. challenging the status quo and trying to look at look at this from different lenses. But those we do have it for a number of different niches, just not all of them yet. Absolutely, um, and I I think it's it's something that is is really interesting in the fact that 
and a lot of vendors do reach out to you and ask to be on this list. And I, you know, obviously get visibility to your reply, but I'm, I'm wondering if you can take our audience through, what if a vendor reaches out and says, you know, Eric, I'll give you a hundred million dollars if you put me on your top 10 list, what do you say? Well, it does happen every day. Not a hundred million. I have not yet been offered a hundred million dollars to feature them, but um, yeah. definitely been offered money. Um, and by the way, it's, in some ways, when you're building a consulting practice, it's easier just to take money from vendors. And that's why yeah. most consulting firms do, uh, because it's, it's immediate revenue. They help you with selling, they, you know, partner with you, all that stuff. Having said that, you know, we partner with all the major um, mm -hmm. software vendors. We just don't formally partner in terms of uh, revenue share, referral fees. We don't make any money off the vendors, but we do, you know, you do have to play nice. Obviously you have to understand their products. You have to have relationships with them. So we do have that piece of it. It's just without the economic incentive, which is really important to that to that independent model that we have. Uh, but I would say, you know, it, if someone wanted to offer us a bunch of money to feature a vendor in our top ten list, I'd say go to any of the other ERP vendors in the marketplace because they're that's their model. Go to Gardner. You know, Gardner takes money to commission reports. You're going to get you're going to get more uh, more alignment with what you're trying to accomplish with someone like Gardner or any other ERP consulting firm out there. That uh, ninety nine percent of them are sort of that pay to play model. So it's not with us though. So I'd say unless it's a hundred million, if it's a hundred million or a billion or more, I might consider it, but um, you know, it, it's not something in all seriousness, all kidding aside, we, we don't take money for any of that. But yeah. now even this podcast, we get all the time software vendors that want to want me to feature their product on this podcast. They'll pay me $10,000 or $20,000, whatever it is, they'll throw numbers out and we just say, no, because the, yeah. the minute we do that, we lose our credibility. It undermines our business model. And and me personally, I wouldn't stay at, at a company that didn't reflect my personal values. And at yeah. that point, it, at that point, I probably wouldn't be at third stage consulting anymore if uh, that was the direction it went. Absolutely. But it would pollute our overall mission here, right, is to provide that independent business advisory. Um, but Definitely a, a great list to read through, um, especially in, in the report format. It gives you the opportunity to kind of put it in context with other top 10 lists, whether it's trends in the industry, whether it's organizational change tactics. So that is available for download on our website. It is free. Um, so please feel free to, to go check that out. And um, thank you for putting together this, this great list for us to kind of understand the movement. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for the great follow up questions and uh, be curious to hear the audience's uh, thoughts and questions and feedback on that as well. They, we, I get lots of feedback on YouTube every day from that video um, or any of the top 10 rankings, you know, people saying mm -hmm. they strongly believe their product or the product that they work with should be number one or in the top 10 or whatever, or, you know, a lot of times I get criticisms of whoever's number one. It, it doesn't matter who I put in at number one, someone's not going to like it. And I'm going to get a lot of feedback, yeah. but I love hearing it because it's good. It's good feedback, yeah. especially when it's a company that actually uses the product. Not, I, I sort of take it with a grain of salt when a vendor themselves or a system integrator that specializes in a product tells me that I'm wrong. I don't, I listen, but I don't really take it too seriously. But when it's an organization that says, "Hey, we use this product, and here are the things we like and don't like about it," that's that's what yeah. I like hearing. So, love to hear any feedback. Absolutely, today. yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, well, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening here today. Uh, again, new episodes every Wednesday. YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, you can find new episodes there as well as on all the audio podcast platforms. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. And in the meantime, hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time on Transformation Ground Control. Take care. Mm -hmm.